after about a nine-month break, we are jumping back into the Gospel of John. Um, and so I'm excited about diving back in because this next several chapters are just rich, rich, rich. And I realized this week that the passage this morning, Ing has already spoken on a couple of weeks ago, but I wasn't here and it wasn't recorded, so I have no idea what he said. So, um, so you might be hearing content again. And if that's true, maybe God is really trying to say something to you this morning. So instead of saying, I've heard this, say, all right, God, what are you teaching me? So John 15 is where we're going to be, John 15. And we're going to look at the first 17 verses of John 15. And already in John, we have seen a few miracles of Jesus, but a lot of teachings of Jesus um, and, God, and a lot of interactions of Jesus interacting with individuals like Nicodemus and the woman at the well and just how he um, just loved and cared for people. And in John 15, we're coming down to the last hours of Jesus' life. And Jesus is pouring into the lives of his disciples. And he is saying some things that you and I need to hear this morning. Um, because if these are the final statements of Jesus, these are important statements. Who am I? Why do I do the things I do? How do I change? If we could figure out the answer, especially to that last question, we would save ourselves a lot of pain, a lot of heartache. Change. It's like the motto of every presidential election lately, right? And even though each candidate makes a lot of promises about change of things that, they will, that will happen when they're elected, change rarely ever happens. And the reason is the motto is, the reason is that the motto is always appealing to the masses. Everyone wants change, even though they don't know what change will look like. They just want things to be different. They want something different. And with All of this talk about change, what about us personally? How do we change? How do we become more like Jesus? How do we become less like the things, how do we lose the things that we struggle with and become more full of the things that Jesus wants in our lives? If we're all honest this morning, we will all admit that we're not really what we want to be. That we're all struggling with sins or temptations or struggles in our lives that we're not where Jesus desires of us. This is why bookstores over the last few decades have introduced a whole new section of books called self-help books. In fact, last year, that self-help industry is an $11 billion industry. That's a ton of money. People want to change. But what is the source of real change? How do we change where We're not just changing for a season and then going back to our old ways. We're not just putting a Band-Aid on the problem, but we are completely transformed. How do we pick ourselves by our bootstraps and make that change happen? Is it a change of circumstances? Maybe you're here and you're sitting here and saying, well, I don't need to change. It's my husband that needs to change, or it's my wife that needs to change. If they would change, then life would be so much better. But you've got to be careful of that statement because that's exactly what the religious leaders we're doing in Jesus' day. And Jesus had some of his harshest words for religious leaders. Calling someone a tomb of dead bones is not a compliment. And yet that's what he would call the Pharisees and the Sadducees that would consistently have conversations with him. So you need to see this morning that real change needs to occur within you first. Draw a circle around yourself this morning and consider your own soul. Not your husbands, not your wives, not your wife's, not your children's, not your parents, not your neighbors, not your coworkers, not your bosses, or the person sitting next to you, but yourself. Consider how you need to change. How do followers of Jesus go about this? How do we change? How do we grow? Some of you in this room, you're brand new to the faith. You've recently encountered Jesus and you're growing. Some of you are starting to sprout. You're seeing God's fruit showing up in your life. Others of you, you're maturing. You've been following Jesus for a while and you're seeing growth and you're seeing impact of you growing with Jesus. And in our passage this morning, we find Jesus and his disciples, they're leaving the upper room and they're going to the garden to a spot where Jesus would pray and spend time with the Father. And as he's passing through the night, he's talking to the disciples and he comes to a vineyard and he uses this as an illustration to teach the disciples of how much they need him. 
Jesus is about to leave them. In a few days, he's gone, and he wanted them to understand that they had the potential for enormous change through the Holy Spirit that he would send to reside in them. Do you believe that? Do you believe that by God's grace and through the work of the Spirit that you're not a lost cause? Do you believe that you don't have to be the way you are right now, that if you are in Jesus, that growth can happen, growth is happening, and change is occurring even if you don't see it? So now Jesus told them that they would fail, but he's promising that they will get back up and they would be radically changed for his glory. And that would be used in far beyond their imaginations. That he was going to transform them from being timid people to being bold people, from being prideful people to being humble people, from being selfish people to being loving people. In our text this morning, we're going to see five things of how change happens in our lives. Five things. Number one, Change happens by exposure. Look at verse 1. I am the vine. I'm the true vine. And my father is the gardener. I'm the true vine. The father is the gardener. This is the last I am statement that Jesus makes in the Gospel of John. Already in our study, we've seen that Jesus makes statements such as, I'm the bread of life. I'm the light of the world. I'm the door of the sheep. I'm the good shepherd. I'm the resurrection and the life. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And now he says, I'm the vine. And here we find Jesus telling his disciples that we need to see him not simply as a way to God, but also as a way for our lives to be completely transformed. That they need to see him as Savior, Lord, and treasure in order to change, in order to get back on their feet. That they need the gospel not just to become a follower of Jesus, but they need the gospel every single day. The gospel is not just the entrance into the house, The gospel is the house. The gospel is what transformed us. Remember, these disciples of Jesus were coming from a Jewish background. And if they went to Sunday school growing up, they would have learned a lot about vines from the Old Testament passages. But the problem was all the Old Testament references to about vines were that these people were out of control, that they were rebellious, that they had um, wild, that that the vine was producing rotten fruit. They were like branches that were laying on the ground producing no fruit at all. And Jesus comes along and he says that if you want to grow and if you want to flourish and if you want to bear fruit and if you want to progress in your life, then you need to be tapped in to Jesus. You need to be connected to Jesus, that he was the true vine, that if you're connected to him, you will bear fruit. What Israel could never be, Jesus was. Look at verse 2. Every branch in me that does not produce fruit, he removes. Now, that word removes, I think, is not a really good translation. The more accurate translation is, every branch that he does not produce fruit, he takes up or he lifts up. It's the idea of the gardener coming and lifting the branches high enough so that it could be exposed to the sun. It's not him chopping it off necessarily. And this is one of the most essential elements of the vineyard, exposure to constant sunlight. If the vine is laying in the shade or if the sun is being blocked from the vine, the plant will die. It will not grow. The vine won't yield grapes laying on the ground or in the shade. They tend to wither and be unfruitful. They need exposure to the sun. And this is why they are mainly located in places that are sunny most of the year, fairly warm and usually on a hillside to get constant exposure to the sun. And what Jesus is saying, that if you're not producing fruit, but you're in me, the Father is going to lift the vine that are dragging on the ground, laying in the shade. Why? Why does he do that? Because he loves you. Because he wants to see you produce fruit. Because he wants to see you flourish. He doesn't want to see you wither and die. He wants to see life come out of you. He wants to see just something new and fresh happening in your life. And he says, listen, if you're laying on the ground and no fruit is coming, the Father is going to come and he's going to expose you to the Son. And friends, that is an encouragement to you because that means that Jesus actually does love you and care for you and wants to see something. God will cleanse the vine. He will remove insects and parasites and lift them up on the trellis so that they're out of the dirt and they're exposed to the Son. What is the Son that we as followers of Jesus need? It's the gospel. 
We need the gospel, the story of the Bible. We need to be exposed to the life-giving power of God's word as we look to see it in the person and the work of Jesus. And listen, that may seem obvious. This may seem obvious to you. But in order to grow, you have to get your face out of the dirt. Right? There are sins in your life. There are things that you are so enamored with. Things that your heart's affections are clinging to that are keeping you from seeing Jesus as your joy and your treasure. And then, because of that, you will open your scriptures and you'll open the Bible and you'll read it and it's just black and white. There's no life there. There's no joy there. But friends, you need vulnerability before God to lay yourself before his presence, to ask him to search you, to know you so that you could see Jesus and treasure Jesus and love Jesus. And as a result of that, you become changed and transformed. Over the summer, when we were going through the study of James, the one passage that really stood out to me so powerfully. It was James 1, 21. It said, Therefore, rid yourself of filth and evil excess by humbly receiving the word of God, which is able to save or transform you. How do you get rid of filth and how do you get rid of sin? By exposure to truth. By exposure to light. By exposure to Jesus. Oftentimes what we do is we're so focused on trying to get rid of our sins that all of our focus is on our sin. And we make the sin the big thing. Friends, your sins is a small thing. Jesus is the big thing. The way sin loses its grip on you is, become when, you, is when you become more consumed with something better. When you become more consumed with Jesus, the less stronghold sin has. Expose yourself to God's word. Expose yourself to the truth of God's word and see the power of sin being broken in your life. Number two, change happens through pain. Change happens through pain. Verse, the rest of verse two says, he prunes every branch that produces fruit so that it will produce more fruit. Now, this whole pruning idea, I'm not a gardener. I, anything I touch dies in terms of plants. And so I've actually had to look it up MaximumYield.com. It's an actual website about how to get the most fruit. Um, there's a website for everything, right? Um, there's an important, it says it's an important gardening skill. Pruning refer, refers to the trimming and the cutting of plants to rid them of any injured, dead, infected roots and woods. In some cases, pruning is also used as a preventative measure to make space for new growth, for new things to happen. Things like grapevines and fruit trees and roses and daisies require specialized pruning techniques to avoid causing any damage to the plant. Listen, if you and I were watching someone pruning a plant, it would look like they were murdering the plant. It would look like they were just ripping it to shreds. It would look like waste because by the time they're done, all the green leaves are gone, the branches are lying, and there's some fruit that's lying on the ground, and the tree looks dead. They say a grapevine reacts to the way that you prune. If you prune for fruit, you will have fruits. If you prune for shoots, you'll have shoots. One gardener could prune for aesthetic purposes and get some nice looking plants, but a gardener that prunes for fruit, while it may not look good, it will produce fruit. It will produce something good. And what Jesus is saying is the Father is going to prune you and you prune me so that our lives would produce fruit. Not just so that we will look good. Not just so that we would be comfortable. Not just so that our lives would be perfect. But he wants fruit. As a matter of fact, much of the pruning process at first makes you look pretty bad. It makes you uncomfortable as Jesus brings out things in your life into the open and it becomes apparent to others around you that you're not as put together as you want everyone else to look, seem. But he brings that stuff out into the open to change you. He wants real change in you. Change that will allow you to impact the lives of people in your life. God, listen, friends, God doesn't want you to be a painting on his wall. He doesn't want you to be a masterpiece. He wants you to be a tool in a shed that he can use. A painting on a wall looks nice, but if your life is making a difference in the lives of so many other people, that's powerful. 
He doesn't desire for you to just be someone that everyone looks at and says, oh, look at him. He looks, he's got his life together. He wants your life to make a deep impact. Now listen, many times those branches were cut back. They were cut back, will look good. The branches that were cut will look good. And you'll wonder, why, God? Why are you cutting that part off? But God is a masterful gardener. And he knows where to cut. And he also knows how deep to cut. See, there might be things in your life that are good things that you have made ultimate things and you didn't realize it. And the Bible calls them idols. Maybe there are things in your life that you're leaning in so hard onto. And Jesus says, listen, that you've fallen in love with that more than you've fallen in love with me. And so let me prune you a little bit. Let me cut you up a little bit. Let me shake you up a little bit. Let me cause some pain so that you would stop leaning so heavy on that and start leaning heavy on me. Some of you right now are going through pruning seasons, and I've heard from you that in this season, what's happened more than anything is you become more dependent on Jesus. And as a result of your hardships and the results of your difficulties, what the result of it is you've drawn in to the Father. And while the pain is not enjoyable, while the pain is hard, the result of it is you've gone closer to Him. And it's producing fruit in your life. You're becoming dependent on Him. Those good things that you lean on, if they become ultimate things, Jesus says, I'm going to shake you up a little bit. I'm going to cut those things off. Listen, always remember that God prunes because he in his infinite wisdom says that you might think that's a great thing, but ultimately if you pursue that, you will end up in despair. You'll end up in disappointment. The Father doesn't want you to just have a little fruit, but he wants you to have a lot of fruit, and that's going to require some pruning, some cutting, some removing, so that your life would produce what he wants to produce. Now, sometimes when you prune, like, say, a rose bush, right, um, it looks like you just killed the thing. There's nothing left. There's absolutely nothing, and you wonder if it ever will come back to life. And sure enough, when the spring comes, it produces incredible flowers incredible fruit. Pruning always hurts because it's always beneficial for the purposes that God has for you. The psalmist in the 119th Psalm has several verses in that passage that talks about the blessings that come when God prunes you. In fact, Psalm 119 verse 67 says, the psalmist says that before he was afflicted, or let's use our translation, before he was pruned, um, he had this tendency to get distracted, to go astray, to lose passion for Jesus, to lose purpose, to get caught up in his own stuff. But because God pruned him, because God was working in him, now I love your word. Verse 71 basically reiterates the same thing. He says, it was good, it was beneficial, it was meaningful, it was worthwhile for me to have been afflicted, for me to have been pruned because I have learned your ways because of that. C.S. Lewis, you haven't heard me quote him in a while, wrote a book called The Voyage of the Dead Threader. And in this book, he has a character by the name of Eustace, um, Eustace, who is an incredibly selfish boy who is so consumed with himself. And he wanders off from the group that he's with, and he finds a cave that's full of treasure. And he dreams of the life that could be his and the comforts that he is now going to enjoy. And in his comfort, and as he's dreaming about all this stuff, he ends up falling asleep among this treasure, and he has this bracelet around his arm. And when he wakes up, this boy is no longer a boy, but now he's a dragon. The outward manifestation of his inner greed and his selfishness. The gold bracelet that he put on the boy's arm was now constricting his dragon leg. And the pain was painful. And even worse was the physical pain, was the pain of realizing that he was now cut off from humanity that he was isolated, that he was alone, that no one would associate with him. And he begins to cry and weep, and he tries to peel the skin off, but each time he peels, more scales would appear. Three times he tried, and he failed, and he was about to give up when Aslan, the lion, the Jesus figure in the story, shows up and offers to help. And to quote Lewis in the book, he says, this is what the lion said, and I don't know if he spoke or not, but this is what I heard. You'll have to let me undress you. And I was afraid of his claws, I can tell you that. But I was pretty nearly desperate. So I just laid flat on my back and I just let him do it. The very first tear he took was so deep that I thought it had gone right to my heart. And then he began pulling the skin. It hurt worse than anything I've ever felt in my entire life. And the only thing that was able to keep me, allow me to bear it 
was just the pleasure of feeling the stuff being taken off. It's painful, but it's good for you. Listen, if you are here and you're a follower of Jesus, what you've said is, Jesus, I don't know how to live my life. I want to live my life for your glory because you know what's best for me. And so it might be painful, but because you're in the palm of his hands, it's good for you because he knows what's good for you. Verse 3 of John 15 says, You are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. To be made clean and to be pruned is the exact same word. His word has already pruned and cleansed them. And so in a sense, you've already been cleaned. You're already pruned. You're a vine that's supposed to be bearing fruit. But how? How are you supposed to do that? And the answer is Jesus. When God looks at you, he doesn't see you, but he sees Jesus. This is good to know as we go through the process or the pain of pruning because of his death on your behalf. The disciples could take comfort knowing that they were already clean and they were already pruned and they were already bearing fruit. They were already doing great works because the Father saw in them Jesus. Listen, you and I, when the Father sees us, he doesn't see us, but he sees Jesus for all that he's done, even though practically we don't look like Jesus. When the Father sees us, he sees Jesus. See, so many times, you and I, we find our identity in our failures. You find your identity in all the times you've messed up, all the sins that you've done, all the stupid stuff that you have gone through, and you have labeled yourself such as such, I'm an alcoholic or I'm a depressed person, and you've labeled yourself by things other than in Jesus. But Jesus is saying, listen, I want you to see that the Father is pruning you so that you would bear fruit because of the death of Jesus, that you are now supposed to bear fruit and be beautiful in His sight. That means you are not a depressed Christian, you are a Christian who deals with depression. You are not a lustful Christian, you are a Christian that deals with lust. You're not an angry Christian, you are a Christian who struggles with anger. You are first and foremost a Christian. Your identity in Christ is built on a foundation that will never shift, even though your emotional state may change from day to day. You are not beyond the redemptive power of Jesus. Your Christ-centered identity does not eliminate the ongoing struggle that you face in your life, but you are not defined by a particular sin. Your identity is that you are first and foremost a child of God. You need to hear that. I need to hear that. I need to be reminded of that day in and day out. When I fail, I need to be reminded that I am not going to be defined by my failures. I am already called a son of God. Number three, change happens in connection. Change happens in connection. Verse four, here in this passage, Jesus is going to teach us that growth happens organically. Change doesn't happen based on mechanical compliance or external force. It is something that must happen internally because you are connected with Jesus, abiding in Jesus. Look at verse 4. Remain in me, and I in you. And just as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains in the vine, neither can you unless you remain in me. Some of your Bibles, the word there is abide. Abide in me. The abide is the idea of remaining getting hot up here. Jesus is telling the disciples, hey, stay close to him. Not just physically, but spiritually. Stay connected with the vine in communion with him. It's a simple illustration. If the branch is not connected to the vine, it will not bear fruit. Why? Because there's no power source. There's no nutrients. There's no life. You want to be productive? You want to be fruitful? Stay connected. Stay connected. Some of you, I've heard this, like, I don't seem to be growing. I don't seem to have a passion for Jesus. And when we start pushing in, start pushing in deeper, you don't have a prayer life. You're not reading scripture. How can you expect to just simply flow in connected with Jesus if you're not actually connected with Jesus? if you're not connected to the vine. A branch that runs down the street crying freedom is a dead branch. 
It needs to have life breathed back into him. Listen, you're about as free on your own apart from Jesus as a fish is out of water. You might flap a little bit here and there, but before long, you're dead. In verse 16, if anyone does not remain in me, he's thrown aside like a branch and he withers. They gather them, throw them in the fire, and they are burned. And Jesus is making it very clear here in this passage, there are some branches that were never part of the tree. It looked like they were part of the tree. Some kid saw a branch there lying on it, and he picked it up and threw it in the tree, and it looked like he was there. But it wasn't part of the tree. There was no life. There was no fruit. There was no transformation. And there are many examples in the Gospel of John we've already seen of people that were interested in Jesus, maybe even followed Jesus, but they never really loved Jesus. Some of them just wanted miracle-working Jesus or instant food Jesus or oppression-free Jesus or uh, Messiah Jesus that would deliver them from Rome, but they weren't looking for Jesus as the Lord and Savior of their lives and what Jesus could do for them. Listen, the point is that change doesn't occur by externally trying to get in with Jesus. He doesn't want you to be outwardly conformed with no inward transformation. He's not desiring that you would just simply say the right words or do the right things. He wants your whole life transformed. Many in the crowds that followed Jesus were just trying to get in with Jesus, but they didn't want Jesus inside of them. And Jesus is telling that there are many, like Judas, who doesn't want to have Jesus in them. But listen, if you're a follower of Jesus, it means that you are someone whose entire life is centered on Jesus. It's not simply stating, hey, I believe the creeds or I believe doctrine about the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. But it's saying, hey, Jesus, my life is yours. It belongs to you. That he is the Savior who loves you and takes you and transforms you. You've heard me quote Lewis's statement before, but in his book, Mere Christianity, he says, Christ says, give me all. I don't want so much of your time and so much of your money and so much of your work. I want you. I haven't come to torment your natural self. I've come to kill it. No half measures are any good. I don't want to cut off a branch here and cut off a branch there. I want to take the whole tree down. Hand over the whole natural self. All the desires that you think are innocent as ones that you think are wicked. Just give me everything. And I will give you in its place a brand new self. In fact, I will give you myself. My own self will become yours. Verse 7, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you want and it will be done. Verse 8, my Father is glorified by this, that you produce much fruit and prove to be my disciples. Jesus says that the Father delights. The Father delights. The Father is pleased when he sees fruit in your life and my life. The fruit that God bears in your life through his spirit proves that you're genuine. People who are changing organically, internally, from the inside out have real fruit. They're not just going to church more or giving more. They are kinder. They're more loving. They're full of joy. They're people that are contagious and you want to be around them. Listen, you can duct tape some fruit to a tree, but that fruit is going to die. It's not connected to the vine. You can't enforce change through conformity, through standards or rules. But friends, you can experience change when you're connected to Jesus. Verse 9, as the Father has loved me, so also I have loved you. Remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. And here we find the connection to Jesus is centered on the love of God. It is knowing that you are loved by God because of Jesus that you draw even closer to God. When you realize that you are unconditionally loved by God through faith in Jesus, you don't need to duct tape fruit to your life. You are starting to bear real, genuine fruit. Obedience to Jesus flows from that. Honoring Jesus flows from that. God isn't glorified by your duct tape fruit. He wants you in all of your brokenness. He wants you honest and transparent before him. And the one thing that we can all give to Jesus 
is our brokenness. And friends, that's exactly what he wants. True change doesn't happen from an outside-in perspective. It happens from an inside-out. Change happens through exposure. Change happens through pain. Change happens through connection. Number four, change happens for community. Change happens for community. Listen, what's the purpose of you being changed? Jesus changes you not just for your own sake, but he changes you for the sake of the community, the entire church. Verse 12. This is my command. Love one another as I have loved you. You know you are changing when you see an increased love for other believers, especially for those who are not like you. And Jesus here is communicating the importance of community life, that we need each other, and we need his work in our life. His pruning is for the benefit of our community. Jesus is pruning you so that you become more loving, to those in the church that are with you. He is doing his work in you so that as you start to see people and look at people and you start caring for people, you begin to have empathy for people. Does you realize that this is why your commitment to the local church is so important? Anyone can bounce from one place to another every time they experience tension or conflict in a church. That's easy. Your commitment to love the church And by that, I mean the people of the church, not the building or the programs or the music is evidence of God's saving faith and God's growth in your life. Do you know that God even uses difficult people in the church for your growth? Anyone can love those that love them, but Jesus wants you to grow to where you love those who don't always love you back. This is why you need difficult people in your life. That's why you get married. They make you grow. Right? Your marriage. No one produces, no one exposes more sin in your life than your spouse. Where no one, God uses no one better than your spouse to expose the junk in your life. And yet because that person in your life, what happens is you end up having more joy, more peace, more patience, more love because God's using your spouse to make you more like Jesus. And the same is the context of community. It's easy to just simply be around people that just do everything you want them to do and love everything you love, but when you bring together people that are different and you say, hey, we are family and we're going to sometimes bump each other or sometimes things conversations are going to be hard but through that process we become more full of joy and more full of love god uses community god uses people to make us more like him this is such a big deal to jesus that he in essence says if you don't love others it's because you don't love him god's pruning in your life has always been for the goal of a healthier life of the church verse 13 No one has greater love than this, but lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I do not call you servants anymore, because a servant doesn't know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything I have heard from my Father. See, here's where we find the power to love, the power to change, the power for growth. It's the cross. The power is found in the fact that you were so sinful that God had to die for you. And yet, friends, you are so loved that God himself was willing to die for you. Notice, Jesus' love for his disciples is what he calls them. He calls them friends. He calls the disciples friends because even when they were about to be anything but friends, in a few hours, they would reject him. In a few hours, they would deny him. But friendship with God is all part of the gospel. It is the fruit of the gospel. Servants just do what they're told. That's religion. Religious people view themselves as servants of God or soldiers of Jesus. Their identity is found in what they do for Jesus. But friends, as followers of Jesus, we are friends of God. We are children of God. Their identity is not found in what they do their identity is found in who they belong to. Listen, 
my children can come into my office room when I'm working anytime they want and sit on my lap. Why? Because they're mine. Right? They're mine. My children can jump on my bed anytime they want except when I'm sleeping. Um, <laughs> why? Because they're mine. You are a child of God. Let that sink in. Let that sink in deeper. And I'm going, I I will try to finish today sometime before the Super Bowl. But you are a child of God. Their anchor, their life on that identity. If you are going to grow as a Christian, you have to continually reflect on your identity as a child of God, as a friend of God, more than as a servant of God or a soldier of God or someone that just a follower or a Christian. You need to realize that you are a child of God, that you are not his slave or his soldier primarily, that you are a son, a daughter, a friend primarily. And that truth will drive you to say, God, because you have called me your child, because you have called me your friend, then let me do whatever you call me to do. I want to serve you. I want to follow you. But this child status, this friend status is what forms your attitude, your perspective, your demeanor for the rest of your life. And all of this leads to growth and change, not just for you, but for the sake of others. Verse 17 says that all of this teaching on growth is as though you would love one another. This speaks to the fact that you don't just expect to grow on your own. The reason you can't do it on your own is that, listen, you have tremendous blind spots. You think you're okay, but ask your spouse, right? You think you're okay, but ask your roommate. They will show you and expose to you all the blind spots you have in your life. You need each other so that you would grow. Everyone else's sins are in front of you, but your sins are behind your back. You need community for identification of your sin, but also so that God could change you and transform you. Someone's getting fussy. Last point. Change happens for missions. Change happens for missions. Verse 16. You didn't choose me, but I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce fruit and that your fruit should remain so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. This is what I command you, love one another. Jesus tells them that now they have become friends and why he calls them friends is because of grace. Jesus chose them before the world began. And in choosing them, he determined that you and I should go. You are chosen to carry the torch of Jesus' self-sacrificing love to the world. You are not chosen to sit and soak and sour. You weren't chosen to simply to take up space here Sunday mornings. You and I were chosen by God before the foundations of the world so that we can go. And you hear me say this every week. You are called to your workplaces. You go to your campuses. You are called to your family. Some of you are called to the mission field. But all of us are called. You have been chosen before the foundation of the earth to go and you will bear fruit as you go, fruit that will last because Jesus has determined that it will be. So fruit is where we will bring benefit to the lives of others and advance the work of the work of the gospel because God's kingdom is advanced not just through truth but through truth in love. Not just through work but through work in love. Listen, if you are being changed from the inside out, if you are being melted by the grace and you're making a difference for Jesus, you will be making a difference for Jesus in this world. You don't just seek change or provide help. You seek change in Jesus and provide help with humility and joy. The greatest change happens while you're on mission. Many times we as Christians, we skip the go part. and We just want to bear fruit. But you can't bear the kind of fruit that God wants in your life if you're not on mission for Jesus. Many of you will testify that it wasn't until you got out of your comfort zone when you went on a mission trip or you did something that you weren't comfortable with that you started seeing significant change in your life. This has always been the goal of growth of God's people. So we can be on mission. All right, let me close. In just hours... The disciples would not remain in the vine. 
They're going to be cutting themselves off from the vine, and there are going to be those branches that are running down the street, crying freedom. They're going to leave Jesus because they were afraid of their lives. They will lose vitality, and they will lose fruitfulness. You see, in hours from now, Jesus will be taken to a hill called Golgotha. And there he, even though he was innocent, will be nailed to the cross like a criminal. A tree that would provide the nourishment of forgiveness and redemption and reconciliation with his death. And the disciples would find themselves grafted back into the tree. And it is there that their lives become transformed. Pick up Acts and start reading how their lives are completely different. And as a result, they would turn the world upside down with the gospel, the story of love, the story of a rescue plan that comes to fruition, a rescue from sin and death and hell and the power of Satan. And they would remain there no matter how far they would go on mission, always grafted into the cross, never leaving the cross. No matter where God would send them into the world, they would be full of fruit. They would find nourishment and power and be changed by the Savior on that tree. This is where you are changed as well. Philippians 3 says it this way, more than that, I also consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Jesus as my Lord. Because of him, I've suffered the loss of all things and considered them as dung, as garbage, as waste, so that I may gain Jesus that I may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but one that is in faith in Christ. My goal is to know him, to know the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering, to be conformed to his death. My friends, Jesus is everything. He is why we're gathered here today. He's why we take communion every Sunday. Because communion is a reminder to us that we didn't find God, but God in His grace found us. And so we come back reminding ourselves that we need Him. This is why we give of our offerings and sacrifice our time to serve Him. This is why we engage in local missions and global missions. This is why we do community groups, because Jesus is everything. He's everything. As we go to the table, you'll find bread, you'll find juice. Listen, this table is for you as a follower of Jesus. You take the bread that represents the body of Jesus that was broken for you. You take the juice that represents the blood of Jesus that was spilled for you. And you remember the work that he did to call you into the family of God. So can I invite you to talk to him? Talk to him about where you are with him. Thank him for what he has done in your life already. Think back to even just this past year or the last several months or the last decade of what he has done and see how far you have come in your walk with Jesus. Repent where you need to repent. If you've never experienced the grace of God in your life, can I invite you to come meet us and talk to us and help us and let us introduce Jesus to you. If you're here this morning and you need prayer for anything, Christine and Jonathan are in the back, ready, available to pray with you. If you just need someone to say, hey, would you pray with me? I've had a rough week, but would you pray with me because I'm not growing in my walk with Jesus? Those guys are available to pray, but would you just spend some time with Jesus? Would you repent where you need to repent? Would you rejoice in what God is doing in your life, has done? Even if you don't see fruit right now, would you just rejoice that he's brought you this far? And then as you come to the table, let's worship, celebrating the faithfulness and goodness of Jesus in our lives. Let's worship.